my report, I have the responsibility of uncovering the evidence of a crime. In Detroit and throughout the entire country, internationally, there's been an immense growth of social inequality as described in our first report, which is not simply the product of economic processes. They reflect definite class policies implemented by political parties and individuals from the Obama administration on down. It's extremely important to understand. This wasn't just something that happened. It wasn't because of so-called market forces that somehow stand above society and these things just sort of happened. People made decisions. Detroit is an object lesson in the nature of the capitalist state. The Democrats and Republicans, the governing bodies, the courts, are not neutral arbiters, but are institutions to implement class interests. Behind them stand giant banks and corporations that control economic life and dictate policy, as Jerry just demonstrated. <laughs> Kevin Orr's decision to throw Detroit into bankruptcy on July 18th was the outcome of a political conspiracy that was years in the making. It involved powerful banks, investment houses, law firms like Jones Day, Governor Snyder and his operatives, the former mayor, Dave Bing, and officials in the Obama administration and the trade unions. The operation, which involved deliberate deception blatant conflicts of interest, and flagrant violations of the law and state constitution was sanctioned by a U.S. bankruptcy judge, Steve Rhodes, on December 3rd, 2013. The news media has done everything in its power to conceal from the public the nature of this conspiracy and the impl implications it has for the working class in Detroit and the rest of the country. As I said earlier, it is our contention that a crime has been committed. And as with any crime, it is necessary to review the evidence in order to establish a timeline of events, a profile of the major conspirators, and an exposure of the motives involved. Detroit, which had already been devastated by decades of factory closings and mass layoffs in the auto industry, as Jerry just described. And by the way, I worked at Chrysler between 1976 and 1980, and I witnessed the enormous anger and militancy of the workers there who would go out at the drop of a hat over conditions. Uh, it was not unusual. That's what changed after 1980 with the bailout. Detroit, which had already been devastated, like cities throughout the country, has been hit very hard by the subprime mortgage bubble and the financial crash of 2008. Between 2000 and 2012, the number of employed residents in Detroit fell by half, according to a report by Demos, with the bulk of the jobs being lost in 2008 alone. This sharply reduced tax revenue for the city and worsened the fiscal crisis. Between 2005 and 2011, 67,000 foreclosures took place in Detroit. It affected 158,000 people. That's the equivalent of the city of Dayton. Due to the budget cuts by, by Snyder, Detroit lost $67 million in state revenue sharing each year for three years for a total of $200 million. That accounted itself for nearly a third 
of the city's revenues. The city's financial situation was worsened by the ballooning debt of servicing bonds and financial swindles, such as the interest rate swaps that the banks foisted on the city that will be reviewed in the financialization section of the report later today. In response to this economic crisis, the Obama administration, following the lead of his predecessor, provided unlimited funds to the banks and financial houses by one estimate to be $29 trillion between 2008 and 2011. However, the President made it clear that there will be no bailouts for states or cities. Instead, the crisis will be used to implement far-ranging demands of corporate America, sweeping wage cuts in the auto industry, the dismantling of public education, shifting health care costs onto the backs of workers, and gutting social programs. Six months into his presidency, Obama met with top corporate CEOs and according to an interview in Business Week, discussed the need for a fundamental change in health care, public education, and government operations, which Obama said had to be a mean and lean for the 21st century economy. Now, under Obama, public sector jobs have, been decl have declined by 718,000, largely due by cuts to distressed cities and local governments. That's three quarters of a million people. This is a record number, and only the second time in U.S. history that the total number of public sector jobs have fallen under an administration, the first being under Reagan. Among the public sector workers, more than 330,000 teachers and other public employees lost their jobs. It's quite phenomenal. School districts have shut 4,000 public schools, and the number of students enrolled in charters has more than doubled. Now, this is one chart here on the change in public sector workers under the Obama administration uh, itself. Here, this is what the public sector workers were under Bush. This is what's happened under Obama. The State Budget Crisis Task Force let me go back. Very early in the President's top economic advisors, including former Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker, began to hone in on public employee pensions as the next target. Volcker had overseen the devastating assault on industrial workers in the 1980s. He raised the interest rates to 20% to carry out mass layoffs. He became co-chair of the State Budget Task Force, which issued a report in July 2012 that noted that while company paid pensions for private sector workers have basically disappeared, public sector workers have now only 12% have, have paid pensions. The vast majority of public employees still were covered by pensions. It says here, in 43 states, pension statutes are deemed by constitution explicit statutory language or implication to have created a binding, legally enforceable contract between employer and employee. By being defined as a contract, the report continued, pensions enjoy protection under Article I, Section 10 of the U.S. Constitution, which provides that no state may pass any law that diminishes or impairs a contract. Now, this is a report sanctioned by the Obama administration.
Enter Jones Day, an international law firm which specializes in bankruptcy and counts among its clients Bank of America, Swiss Bank UBS, and other powerful financial interests. Having ground its teeth in a series of, bankrupt of corporate bankruptcies that stripped workers of their pensions, such as the bankruptcy of Chrysler and GM in 2009, his law per partners began writing a number of papers and articles outlining how Chapter 9 municipal bankruptcy could be used to override constitutional protections for, for public employee pensions. Actually, I actually wasn't able to get the article in time. <laughs> the, the article, an overview of Chapter 9 of the U.S. Bankruptcy Municipal Code in debt said the following. Current and future pension liabilities constitutes one of the largest problems facing municipalities. Considered to be virtually untouchable in states that treat pensions, benefits as vested rights, parenthesis, and therefore not subject to unilateral amendment or termination based upon various constitutional concerns, in the parenthesis, most efforts to reduce or modify these obligations outside of Chapter 9 end in failure at best with minute changes. The question remains, however, whether Chapter 9 provides an opportunity to expand the circumstances under which the pension liability problems can be addressed. This is what they said in 2010. March 2011. Another article by Jones Day is addressing the same issue, entitled Pensions in Chapter 9. Can municipalities use bankruptcy to solve their pension woes? It was more explicit. In it, two attorneys at the Atlanta, Jones, at the Atlanta offices of Jones Day write, the purpose of this article is to identify certain tools and strategies offered by Chapter 9 and to consider whether individually or in unison they may offer a real workable solution to the overwhelming and seemingly unassailable pension obligations of many municipal debtors. Now what they were talking about was pensions that totaled one to four trillion dollars throughout the country that they were looking for ways to get rid of. This blueprint was followed to the T after Republican Rick Snyder, a multimillionaire and, full, and former vulture capitalist, was inaugurated as governor of Michigan in January 2011. Thus, we have a clear motive for the bankruptcy to use the courts to tear up pension obligations that are otherwise protected by the state constitution. There were, of course, other aims. The attack on health care, city workers, privatization, and city services, the realization of downtown according to plans drawn up by billionaires like Gilbert. However, pensions were a very important part of this plan. Another important part of the arsenal, this tool of arsenals, was the emergency manager law. A law that was far, in a certain sense, unique to Michigan. This will be reviewed in greater detail in another report by, that will be given by our legal experts. But suffice it to say here that the passing of this law and the appointment of an unelected managers who were given virtually unlimited powers to tear up and, and destroy contracts and demand was imposed. Here reviews Governor Snyder signed the Emergency Manager Law into Public, um, Public Act 4. Those powers are it can tear up contracts, it can replace city governments, it can in fact abrogate any official, it remove any official that, that's elected. It says although nine emergency managers were already appointed, the old law was felt to be inadequate. They brought, bring, brought in another law because it was needed to carry out even further cuts and concessions. Armed closely 
with the anti-democratic emergency manager law, manager law, Snyder would work closely with Jones Day Law Firm to both appointing Orr as the emergency manager and shepherding the city into bankruptcy. Now here I'm going to go into a timeline of events that took place, well, I would have to ask you to bear with me because there's a lot of detail. I was just going to, however, choose certain developments which I think highlight this issue. I have to say also that there's so much material. There's just so much material that it's impossible to present it all in a clear way in such a short period of time. But in January 2011, Snyder was inaugurated as, as the governor of Michigan. As you will see, the bankruptcy of Detroit was a comprehensive part of an assault on, the, on workers by the Republican governor since taking office, closely working with the state treasurer, who was a Democrat, Andy Dillon, and, and also was a, was a uh, venture capitalist. Now in 2011, early 2011, there were reports that Mayor Bing, who was another multimillionaire, <laughs> began holding secret meetings with Snyder and, and with his administration. In fact, the report that came out that, Snyder, that Bing was offering himself as the emergency manager candidate over Detroit. On March 17th, Snyder signed the new emergency manager law, Public Act 4, as I explained. Sometime in 2011, the Jones Day law firm was hired by the state of Michigan. Corrine Ball, one of the fellows, told Jeffrey, another fellow lawyer, Jeffrey Ellman, that they had provided 1,000 hours of free service to, quote, position themselves for the bankruptcy in an email to Ellman. He said, we just heard from Buckfire. Apparently, Buckfire is an investment firm who actually uh, encouraged the state to hire the Jones Day Law Firm. He said, just heard from Buckfire. Strong advice not to mention 1,000 hours, except to say we don't have a major learning curve. They're on top of the situation. They're ready to go. On April 4th, 2012, following threats of an imposition of an emergency manager, the city of Detroit and the elected officials there agreed to a consent agreement. That consent agreement they did that in order to forestall an emergency manager coming into the city. They thought that if they had a consent agreement, agreed to massive cuts, that that would not lead to an emergency manager. That one year alone, they cut 25% of the workforce. They carried out a massive assault on jobs. Workers are working, I think, on average one day a month for free. This was not enough, however. The same month, and nearly a year before a financial emergency was declared, discussions took place between state officials and Jones Day to file for bankruptcy of Detroit. In October or November of 2012, Snyder's shadow chief advisor, Richard Baird, begins a search for an emergency manager. During this time, especially after the consent agreement was, ag was signed in April of 2012, a major campaign began to take place to repeal the law. S signatures were collected, I think it was 166,000 were required. The, those who collected the uh, signatures were well over 280,000. There was enormous struggles going back and forth to try to, because the, the uh, Republican, especially the right wing, were trying to keep it off the ballot. They said the font size was too small, any technicality to try to use to stop it from getting on the ballot, but it finally got on the ballot. On November 6, 2012, the emergency manager law was heavily defeated in a statewide referendum. According to the official results, now it's quite significant because I think it was defeated by over 54% of the electorate. And it wasn't just Detroiters. 
This was widespread throughout the entire state. In my review on it, I did a review of every county that carried out the vote. Out of 82 counties, 73% or 89% of all the counties voted overwhelmingly against the emergency manager law. So this idea that was especially being presented by the, uh, by the you know, Democrats and the black elite in Detroit, that the issues in Detroit is a black issue versus white suburbs and so forth and so on, was just not true. In fact, there was quite a lot of concern in the working class against the use of anti-democratic measures throughout the entire state. On December 26, 2012, seven weeks later, a new emergency manager law was passed by the Snyder administration. The new law was almost identical to the old one. The new law was also crafted by Jones Day and scheduled to take effect on March 28th. In many ways, especially after the passing of the new law, there's no question that the fix was in to make sure that the city was taken into bankruptcy. Things began to heat up very quickly in the year 20, 2013. In January, the Jones Day pitch book represented to show city officials where before they were hired by Detroit Mayor David Bing, he saw this, as the city's re restructuring council, documents how they can use an emergency manager in the filing of Chapter 9 bankruptcy in order to reduce accrued pension benefits. This is what it says. The difficulty of achieving an out-of-court settlement and steps to bolster, 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 bolster the cuts. City's ability to qualify for Chapter 9 by establishing a good faith record of negotiations. They're giving, they're giving advice as to how they can go through Chapter 9. And this was shown to Bing in early January. Dave Bing, the, and he was denying the whole thing the whole time. Two, the emergency manager could be used as a political cover for difficult decisions such, an, such as an ultimate Chapter 9 filing. Three, warning that a pre-Chapter 9 asset monetization would implicate the Chapter 9 eligibility requirement regarding insolvency, thus effectively advising the city against raising money in order to will itself into insolvency. They're advising them, you don't want to have a resolution to your economic problems. You want to be bankrupt. You want to show that you have no money. That way, even though the unions actually had offered some $180 million in concessions you know, to, uh, to the, uh, to, to the, you know, to Orr, I mean, sorry, to Snyder during the, um, the uh, consent agreement, it wasn't accepted, in fact, by Dillon in order for them to say that they didn't have enough money in order to go into bankruptcy. Four, describing protections under state law for retiree benefits and accrued pension obligations and how Chapter 9 could be used as a means to further cut back or compromise accrued pension obligations otherwise protected by the Michigan Constitution. They were very conscious that, and aware that pensions in Michigan for public sector workers were protected by the state constitution. And they were looking for a way to get around that and to carry out the cut. In January 2013, several emails show Snyder's office and Bing discussing hiring Kevin Orr, a Democrat involved in the auto restructuring and close to the Obama administration. In fact, Orr was working on Obama's finance campaign, and I think he also was involved in Kerry's campaign earlier. January 31st, again, Dan Moss of Jones Day writes to Orr. It's hard for you to see this, I'm sorry. But these are actual documents that were presented in the court. It seems that the real scenario would be that Snyder and Bing both agree and the best option is simply to go through an orderly Chapter 9. 
This is what they said on January 31st. Also on January 31st, Orr wrote another Jones Day law par partner, this is Kevin Orr, Corrine Ball, admitting that Michigan's new emergency manager law is a, is a clear end around the prior initiative that was rejected by voters in November. This is where he says that right here, so I can find it. It's a clear end around the prior initiative that was rejected by the voters in November. Jones and lawyers are writing at this time as if the selection of Orr for emergency manager is a done deal. Even though Snyder was claiming that he had not chosen an emergency manager, while claiming that he was also considering a number of options to bankruptcy. On February 20th, emails between Orr, Baird and Orr on an agreement for a summary partnership with Bing. This is also another issue which is quite significant. Baird made it clean. Now, clear, Baird is also an important figure here. Maybe I should explain. Baird was a shadowy guy who was doing the backdoor work for Snyder. Snyder presented himself as being sort of for everyone and so forth and so on. Baird had uh, one, he worked for a company which only had one employee himself and was funded by the Nerd Fund that was also uh, created so that the, those who were in it could not be revealed who they were. Now Baird, again, was the one who actually went out and hired Orr. He was looking for an emergency manager back in October and November of 20, 2012. Well, they found one, and they go into how they, they did this back, and they saw what happened was, was when, when um, Jones Day was making its pitch to Detroit, uh, I think it was at the airport on January 27th, Baird saw Orr and realized they had their guy. And uh, they said, because in fact he was a, was, a, was a black bankruptcy specialist, he had proven himself working for Jones Day, he began to hone in on, on Orr. And he goes on and says, Barrett made it clear, clear to Bing that they, would not, they could not accept the partnership without Orr's approval. Now, this is on February 20th. So he has not been hired, he has not been announced, yet he's already approving whether or not contracts and agreements can even be made. Bear said, the summary par uh, partnership has the, has the agreement of Snyder, but that Orr and Bing needed to work it out together. Now what Bing did then, I'll go into this later, was in fact he flew down to Washington and secretly met with Orr on February 25th, but we'll come back to that. The agreement, the summary agreement that, uh, that Bing wanted was to keep his executive committee, his group, in place. It was also to have his pet program, such as the uh, shrinking of Detroit, continued under the emergency manager. And third, that DTE Energy would have the lighting company. On February 22nd, an email sent by Orr to Richard Bard, Snyder's chief shadow advisor again, says Orr was, quote, already behaving as an agent of the state, well before the governor appointed him more than a month later. February 25th, based on a request from Baird, as I said earlier, Snyder, Bing flew down to Washington to meet with Orr. Bing says that Baird had met Orr in January and was impressed with him. This is also where they began discussing all kinds of other matters regarding how uh, they could work with each other once uh, Orr is brought in as emergency manager. On March 1st, Snyder announces that Detroit is in a state of financial emergency, paving the way for the appointment of the emergency manager. On March 8th, Bing's office selects Jones Day as a restructuring council for the city of Detroit. Now that was obviously something that was worked out when they met earlier in February. And against the, against the majority of the city council, he insisted that only Jones Day could represent Detroit. On March 14th, Snyder announces that he has chosen Orr as the emergency manager. And as you see, 
All three of them are together in the presentation. I was there and I took this photograph. It was quite striking that Bing was involved there. Most people were, were, were surprised at this because supposedly he had announced so many times that he was opposed to an emergency manager and so forth and so on. So for him to come out with Orr and Snyder uh, was a bit of a, you know, taking him, some people were taking him aback. In the introduction, Orr made it clear that he was good in bankruptcy court. Quote, I have restructured anything as varied as a horse farm to airlines, to multi-million billion dollar financial conglomerates. These things are very painful. One thing everybody needs to know about Chapter 9 is that bankruptcy is way towards municipalities. I don't want to pull that plug unless I have to. He also made it clear that he would do things that were not sanctioned by the Detroit Charter. Detroit Charter was another issue that they had to get around. This is a constitutional provision that the city residents in the city of Detroit passed, which explicitly opposes privatization and other measures that the emergency manager could carry out. In April, Orr announced that the city was in financial crisis due to the leg legacy costs and the pensions and health care benefits had to be cut. He also proposed that Christie's come in and carry out an evaluation of the artwork of the DIA for the purposes of possibly selling it um, for funds for the city. On June 10th, Orr speaks before a public meeting at Wayne State University here. When asked if pensions would be cut, he openly lied, saying that pensions were, quote, sacrosanct. When asked to explain this, this statement during the bankruptcy trial, Orr said that he wasn't attempting to mislead anyone. I was trying to say we understood the issues around the pensions. Even the judge couldn't accept that one. He asked him, what would you say to that woman now? Orr responded, I would say your rights are in bankruptcy now. On July 10th email, Andy Dillon expressed his concerns about the preparations for the filing of bankruptcy. He said, look, this is, he said this on July 10th, so obviously they were preparing to file for bankruptcy. He says, it looks premeditated, and argued that the state needed to do a better job of explaining why it was necessary. Quote, I don't think we're making the case why we're giving up so soon to reach an out-of-court settlement, Dillon wrote. Quote, he, he advises Orr to say facts got worse as we dug into the numbers. We don't even say they rejected the city's proposal. I think we may want to take it, to, want a take it or leave it demand before we pull this trigger. I agree with the recommendation, but I don't think we have made the case. In other words, what Andy Dillon was saying was that we need at least some kind of a fig leaf of a cover to conceal the conspiracy to throw Detroit into bankruptcy. On July 18th, Snyder and Order filed for bankruptcy of Detroit. Again, I can't go into details here, but it was quite a controversy because at the same time, the state judge was preparing to declare that the bankruptcy or that the, that the emergency manager itself was illegal and that attacking any pensions was against the constitution of the state and therefore could not be carried out. And some kind of finagling, apparently Orr's office and Snyder told the union official not to file, to hold off. And during that five minute period, the official from Orr's office went in and filed in a federal court and later said, well, the federal court trumps the state court and therefore they could do nothing about it. It's quite extraordinary. Now, immediately after they filed for bankruptcy, the Obama administration sided with the support for bankruptcy. They issued a statement saying there will be no bailout for Detroit uh, again. And again later in October, they were asked by the court, after this judge, the state judge in Michigan, said that, look, the whole thing was illegal, 
They asked the federal court judge, um, Rhodes, asked the, uh, the Obama administration for clarification. They wrote a memo saying that it's absolutely legitimate for them to go ahead with bankruptcy. These are some of the firefighters who held a protest in opposition to the attacks on their jobs and on their benefits. It's well known that the firefighters, their, their pensions were fully vested, I think 96%, as one says. However, the difference between the firefighters even and the rest of the city workforce is that firefighters don't receive any, even any security, social security. All they get is their pensions. The average worker in the city of Detroit for pensions is $19,000. It's actually a poverty wage. For, for, uh, for firefighters, it averages around 30,000. But again, without Social Security, people are make, barely able to make it. Now, on December 3rd, the federal court, after a trial both in October and November, declared that the city is officially in bankruptcy. Now, this timeline provides the bare bones of the conspiracy, the most egregious elements of the consciously planning by which major political officials in both parties drove the city into bankruptcy to carry out a preconceived agenda. In his ruling, Judge Stephen Rose was forced to acknowledge the compelling character of the evidence of conscious premeditation. He referred to a, quote, narrative developed by those who opposed the bankruptcy. And according to this narrative, the, the judge said the following. He said that the bankruptcy was an, in, an intended consequence of years-long strategic plan. Its genesis was hatched in a law, by a law firm uh, reviewed by, Jones Day, by the Jones Day attorneys. The plan was executed by top officials in the state of Michigan including Governor Snyder and others in this administration, assisted by the state's legal and financial consultants, the Jones Day Law Firm and the Miller Buckfield Fire Investment Banking Firm. The goals of the plan also included lining the professional's pockets while extending the power of the state government at the expense of the people of Detroit. <laughs> what do you mean by lining the pockets? Is they now are being paid some $17 million in consultant fees and, and, uh, and fees for attorneys during the course of this bankruptcy under a condition where they say there's no money. The plan also saw the value in enticing a bankruptcy attorney to become the emergency manager, even though he did not have the qualifications required in PA 436. Another, this is all being said by the judge who's very conscious, again, about the opponents that who are saying these very things that he's elaborating. Another important part of the plan was for the state government to starve the city of cash by reducing its revenue sharing, by refusing to pay the city millions of promised dollars, and by imposing on the city the heavy financial burden of expensive professionals. The penultimate moment that represented the successful culmination of this plan was the bankruptcy filing. It was accomplished in secrecy and a day before the planned date in order to thwart the creditors who were, at that very moment, in a state court pursuing their available state law remedies to protect their constitutional pension rights. What he said is actually true. Of course, this did not alter Rowe's decision. He found that the city, nevertheless, even though it didn't meet the qualifications of good faith, to be in bankruptcy. In making this decision, and in giving his stamp of approval to the plans to slash pensions and carry out other attacks on the working class, Rhodes merely affirmed that he was on the side of the conspirators. There's one last element that we, I wanted to review. Uh, my review is taking a little longer than I expected, but that is the role of the unions. The unions have presented themselves as being opponents of the bankruptcy and the attacks on the rights of workers. The truth is just the opposite. From the very beginning, the unions 
were in support of massive cuts and attacks to be carried out on the backs of the workers. The American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees Union, which is closely allied to the Democratic Party, has collaborated with the destruction of thousands of city workers' jobs over the past decade. In February 2012, ASPE and Council 25 President Al Garrett attempted to persuade Snyder to postpone plans to appoint an emergency manager by insisting that the unions were willing to impose $180 million in concessions on his own members. The central preoccupation of the unions has been to maintain their own position at the exploitation of the working class, to keep their role as labor contractors. They have accepted the premise of the bankruptcy from the very beginning. Throughout the trial, they would say, we accept that these, they're the city is in, fi in, in financial crisis, and that, they, and that the, the negotiations with the unions could be imposed in one way or another with their assistance. Now, November 2013, the unions filed a motion jointly with the major creditors and the financial institutions demanding the sell-off of the artwork of the Detroit Institute of Arts, that they monetize the values, they call for the maximum monetization of the values of the artwork at the DIA. That very association itself with the very people who are carrying out the assault on workers discredits their whole position. But the penultimate issue, in many ways, is what's come out now at the end. They're now establishing what they call a grand bargain. That is that the state has been able, through the, uh, through the mediator, to get philanthropies to donate $350 million, supposedly, to go towards art and towards the pensions. The state says it was going to also offer $350 million. And they demanded of the DIA that they contribute, through a force, through pressure, $100 million uh, to, towards this effort. It was noticeable that the unions are very quiet, especially during this period of time. What was being worked out behind the scenes was what they call this grand bargain. That is, that everyone agree that the city go through this prepared bankruptcy in a very orderly fashion by agreeing to this money being used for everyone's benefit. Now, the whole thing was deceiving because the private, this money that was being used for the DIA was really to privatize the DIA, as we'll go into later. The money supposedly going towards the pensions was minuscule. They're now still talking about giving, at most, between 25 cents on the dollar, you know, towards pensions. As far as it, it and, but however, what they were working out behind the scenes, again, was an agreement with the unions that they have what they call a VEBA, a Voluntary Employee Benefits Association Package. This VEBA has worked, has worked is, and is modeled on what they did in the auto industry following the Chrysler bailout, the Chrysler GM bailout. That is that money from the retirees' health care benefits will be given over to the unions. In the case of GM and, the, uh, and, and Chrysler, it amounted to some $40 billion. In the case of Detroit, they're talking about maybe around 400 to 500 million. However, for the unions, that's an enormous amount of money. And on that basis, they're fighting to get their agreement to sign off on this whole process. What we're raising here is that this, is, is that this demonstrates that throughout the entire proceedings, the one voice that was not being represented in all of these actions was the voice of the working class. That is the vast majority of the population. Their voice was never heard. This was a conspiracy to attack and drive down the living standards of workers, and it's for this reason that we're holding this investigation.